Four days later, Holmes and I were again in the train, bound for Winchester to see the race for the Wessex Cup. Colonel Ross met us by appointment outside the station, and we drove in his drag to the course beyond the town. His face was grave, and his manner was cold in the extreme. I have seen nothing of my horse, said he. I suppose that you would know him when you saw him, asked Holmes. The colonel was very angry. I have been on the turf for twenty years, and never was asked such a question as that before, said he. A child would know Silver Blaze with his white forehead and his mottled-off foreleg. How was the betting? Well, that is the curious part of it. You could have got fifteen to one yesterday, but the price has become shorter and shorter until you can hardly get three to one now. Hum, said Holmes. Somebody knows something, that is clear. As the drag drew up in the enclosure near the grandstand, I glanced at the card to see the entries. It ran, Wessex Plate, fifty sovereigns each half foot, with a thousand sovereigns added for four and five-year-olds. Second, three hundred pounds. Third, two hundred pounds. New course, one mile and five furlongs. One, Mr. Heath Newton's The Negro, red cap, cinnamon jacket. Two, Colonel Wardlaw's Pugilist, pink cap, blue and black jacket. Three, Lord Backwater's Desborough, yellow cap and sleeves. Four, Colonel Ross's Silver Blaze, black cap, red jacket. Five, Duke of Balmoral's Iris, yellow and black stripes. Six, Lord Singleford's Rasper, purple cap, black sleeves. We scratched our other one and put all our hopes on your word said the colonel. Why, what is that? Silver Blaze's favourite? Five to four against Silver Blaze, roared the ring. Five to four against Silver Blaze. Five to fifteen against Desborough. Five to four on the field. There are the numbers up, I cried. They are all six there. All six there? Then my horse is running, cried the colonel in great agitation. But I don't see him. My colours have not passed. Only five have passed. This must be he. As I spoke, a powerful bay horse swept out from the weighing enclosure and cantered past us, bearing on its back the well-known black and red of the colonel. That's not my horse, cried the owner. That beast has not a white hair upon its body. What is this that you have done, Mr. Holmes? Well, well, let's see how he gets on said my friend imperturbably. For a few minutes we gazed through my field glass. Capital, an excellent start, he cried suddenly. There they are, coming round the curve. From our drag we had a superb view as they came up the straight. The six horses were so close together that a carpet could have covered them, but halfway up the yellow of the Mapleton stable showed to the front. Before they reached us, however, Desborough's bolt was shot, and the colonel's horse, coming away with a rush, passed the post a good six lengths before its rival, the Duke of Balmoral's Iris making a bad third. It's my race, anyhow, gasped the colonel, passing his hand over his eyes. I confess that I can make neither head nor tail of it. Don't you think that you have kept up your mystery long enough, Mr. Holmes? Certainly, colonel. You shall know everything. Let us all go round and have a look at the horse together. Here he is, he continued as we made our way into the weighing enclosure, where only owners and their friends find admittance. You have only to wash his face and his legs and spirits of wine, and you will find that he is the same old silver blaze as ever. You take my breath away. I found him in the hands of a faker, and took the liberty of running him just as he was sent over. My dear sir, you have done wonders. The horse looks very fit and well. It never went better in its life. I owe you a thousand apologies for having doubted your ability. You have done me a great service by recovering my horse. You would do me a greater still if you could lay your hands on the murderer of John Straker. I have done so, said Holmes quietly. The colonel and I stared at him in amazement. You have got him? Where is he then? He is here. Here? Where? in my company at the present moment. The colonel flushed angrily. 
I quite recognize that I am under obligations to you, Mr. Holmes, said he, but I must regard what you have just said as either a very bad joke or an insult. Sherlock Holmes laughed. I assure you that I have not associated you with the crime, Colonel, said he. The real murderer is standing immediately behind you. He stepped past and laid his hand upon the glossy neck of a thoroughbred. The horse? cried both the colonel and myself. Yes, the horse, and it may lessen his guilt if I say that it was done in self-defense, and that John Straker was a man who was entirely unworthy of your confidence. But there goes the bell, and as I stand to win a little on this next race, I shall defer a lengthy explanation until a more fitting time. We had the corner of a Pullman car to ourselves that evening as we whirled back to London, and I fancy that the journey was a short one to Colonel Ross as well as to myself, as we listened to our companion's narrative of the events which had occurred at the Dartmoor training stables upon the Monday night, and the means by which he had unravelled them. I confess, said he, that any theories which I had formed from the newspaper reports were entirely erroneous, and yet there were indications there had they not been overlaid by other details which concealed their true import. I went to Devonshire with the conviction that Fitzroy Simpson was the true culprit, although, of course, I saw that the evidence against him was by no means complete. It was while I was in the carriage, just as we reached the trainer's house, that the immense significance of the curried mutton occurred to me. You may remember that I was distray, and remained sitting after you had all alighted. I was marvelling in my own mind how I could possibly have overlooked so obvious a clue. I confess, said the Colonel, that even now I cannot see how it helps us. It was the first link in my chain of reasoning. Powdered opium is by no means tasteless. The flavour is not disagreeable, but it is perceptible. Were it mixed with any ordinary dish, the eater would undoubtedly detect it, and would probably eat no more. A curry was exactly the medium which would disguise this taste. By no possible supposition could this stranger, Fitzroy Simpson, have caused curry to be served in the trainer's family that night, and it is surely too monstrous a coincidence to suppose that he had happened to come along with powdered opium upon the very night when a dish happened to be served which would disguise the flavor. That is unthinkable. Therefore, Simpson becomes eliminated from the case, and our attention centers upon Straker and his wife, the only two people who could have chosen curried mutton for supper that night. The opium was added after the dish was set aside for the stable boy, for the others had the same for supper with no ill effects. Which of them, then, had access to that dish without the maid seeing them? Before deciding that question, I had grasped the significance of the silence of the dog for one true inference invariably suggests others. The Simpson incident had shown me that a dog was kept in the stables, and yet, though someone had been in and had fetched out a horse, he had not barked enough to arouse the two lads in the loft. Obviously, the midnight visitor was someone whom the dog knew well. I was already convinced, or almost convinced, that John Strager went down to the stables in the dead of the night and took out Silver Blaze. For what purpose? For a dishonest one, obviously, or why should he drug his own stable boy? And yet I was at a loss to know why. There have been cases before now where trainers have made sure of great sums of money by laying against their own horses through agents, and then preventing them from winning by fraud. Sometimes it is a pulling jockey. Sometimes it is some surer and subtler means. What was it here? I hoped that the contents of his pockets might help me to form a conclusion, and they did so. You cannot have forgotten the singular knife which was found in the dead man's hand, a knife which certainly no sane man would choose for a weapon. It was, as Dr. Watson told us, a form of knife which is used for the most delicate operations known in surgery, and it was to be used for a delicate operation that night. You must know, with your wide experience of turf matters, Colonel Ross, that it is possible to make a slight nick upon the tendons of a horse's ham and to do it subcutaneously so as to leave absolutely no trace. A horse so treated would develop a slight lameness, 
which would be put down to a strain in exercise or a touch of rheumatism, but never to foul play. Villain! Scoundrel! cried the colonel. We have here the explanation of why John Straker wished to take the horse out onto the moor. So spirited a creature would have certainly roused the soundest of sleepers when it felt the prick of the knife. It was absolutely necessary to do it in the open air. I have been blind, cried the colonel. Of course that was why he needed the candle and struck the match. Undoubtedly. But in examining his belongings, I was fortunate enough to discover not only the method of the crime, but even its motives. As a man of the world, Colonel, you know that men do not carry other people's bills about in their pockets. We have most of us quite enough to do to settle our own. I at once concluded that Straker was leading a double life and keeping a second establishment. The nature of the bill showed us that there was a lady in the case and one who had expensive tastes. Liberal as you are with your servants, one can hardly expect that they can buy twenty guinea walking dresses for their ladies. I questioned Mrs. Straker as to the dress without her knowing it, and having satisfied myself that it had never reached her. I made a note of the milliner's address, and felt that by calling there with Straker's photograph, I could easily dispose of the mythical Derbyshire. From that time on, all was plain. Straker had led out the horse to a hollow where his light would be invisible. Simpson, in his flight, had dropped his cravat, and Straker had picked it up, with some idea, perhaps, that he might use it in securing the horse's leg. Once in the hollow, he had got behind the horse and had struck a light, but the creature, frightened at the sudden glare, and, with the strange instinct of animals, feeling that some mischief was intended, had lashed out, and the steel shoe had struck Straker full on the forehead. He had already, in spite of the rain, taken off his overcoat in order to do his delicate task, and so as he fell, his knife gashed his thigh. Do I make it clear? Wonderful, cried the colonel. Wonderful! You might have been there. My final shot was, I confess, a very long one. It struck me that so astute a man as Straker would not undertake this delicate tendon-nicking without a little practice. What could he practice on? My eyes fell upon the sheep, and I asked a question which, rather to my surprise, showed that my surmise was correct. When I returned to London, I called upon the milliner, who had recognized Straker as an excellent customer of the name of Derbyshire, who had a very dashing wife with a strong partiality for expensive dresses. I have no doubt that this woman had plunged him over head and ears in debt, and so led him into this miserable plot. You have explained all but one thing, cried the colonel. Where was the horse? Ah, it bolted and was cared for by one of your neighbors. We must have an amnesty in that direction, I think. This is Clapham Junction, if I am not mistaken, and we shall be in Victoria in less than ten minutes. If you care to smoke a cigar in our rooms, colonel, I shall be happy to give you any other details which might interest you.'